Hi and welcome again. Uh, so we learned in the first uh, part of this uh, presentation uh, the innate system and uh, we learned that the innate uh, immune response uh, is consisting of four um, uh, components. Uh, we discussed the interferon, uh, the natural killer cells, uh, we discussed the inflammation and we paused uh, the inflammation a little bit and we discussed how uh, the phagocytosis occurs and um, and the players in the phagocytosis. Um, we also discussed uh, the process of inflammation altogether and uh, the cytokines that are playing a role there and why do we get feverish when we have an infection uh, like sinusitis or pneumonia. We talked about the pyrogens uh, which are generated in response by, uh, by the phagocytic cells uh, by, in response to being activated by the microbes. Finally, the fourth component we discussed was the complement system. We agreed that these are set of uh, nonspecific proteins that would tag um, the, the, the target in a process we call opsonization. And we agreed that these proteins, uh, they are activated in response to either seeing proteins or carbs that are out of norm or in response to the pathogen or that cell being coated with an antibody. And that would be the classic, of course, activation of the complement system. And as for the functions of the complement, we agree that it has many, many functions, and the most important of which is opsonization. And they do what we called MAC, uh, membrane attack complex, and they act as uh, chemotactic uh, signals to attract more leukocytes into uh, the site of inflammation. Uh, they would also activate um, natural killer cells and they play a role in and they activate macrophages and they play a role in the histamine release as well and the activation of kinine as we learned before. So we move from that into something, uh, although it's much more sophisticated and selective, but uh, you will realize it's much easier to deal with, at least to remember, which now we deal with the adaptive immune response. So we have two classes of adaptive immune response. One, that will be antibodies secreted by cells called plasma cells. And these plasma cells are originally uh, B lymphocytes that matured, and we will go, th go through this process. But because it's something that is secreted by the cells, so we'll call that humoral response or the antibody-mediated response. Now, the second one would be cell-mediated response that will involve the activation of T lymphocytes. We have three or so known types of T lymphocytes, cytotoxic T, and we have um, the helper T, and we have the T reg as well, the regulatory T. And if you remember, in the innate um, response, we had also another lymphocyte, which was the natural killer cell, but that was non-selective. We're talking here about the selective and the specific ones. So we're going to start by the B lymphocyte activation. In the humoral response, we're going to pause a little bit to talk about the... Um, the, the antibodies and the classes of the antibodies and how the diversity of antibodies are created inside the, the B lymphocytes uh, during their synthesis, uh, during the synthesis of uh, or the generation of the B lymphocyte cells. So let's start with this. And as you will realize every now and then, we're going to bring one type of the T lymphocytes into the equation. And that will be the T helper. One of the main functions of the T helper cells is to activate other cells, to activate the B cells, and to activate the cytotoxic T cells. It plays both roles. So we can't ignore that while we're talking about the B lymphocyte. So every now and then, we're going to refer uh, to it, uh, to uh, the cytotoxic 
T cells. I also want uh, to the, the, I'm sorry, to the T helper cells. I also want you to realize the following. The B lymphocytes are phagocytic cells. In addition to everything else, in addition to their ability to uh, become plasma cells and to give this uh, beautiful amount of antibodies, which is about 2,000 particles per second um, before they eventually die as a plasma cell. Um, in addition to all that, they also act as phagocytic cells which is very important as we will realize later on because they can be themselves, the B cells, they can be antigen presenting cells. So we're gonna talk about that as we proceed. So this lecture will pretty much deal with this component here. And in the third um, part of this video, we will be dealing with the cell mediated immune response, okay? so. Let's start with the antibody-mediated response or the humor, humoral, humoral immunity, and we will be talking about the B lymphocytes, obviously. So a little bit of an introduction or a history about the B lymphocytes and the T lymphocytes. Both of them, just like any, red, any blood cell, is made in the red bone marrow. Red bone marrow is the house of the, 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 the hematopoietic stem cell that differentiates into different lineages, as we saw earlier in a slide, and we're going to repeat that again when we get to the blood chapter. And it, it, it differentiates into what we call T cells and B cells. And they are completely different. They have different functions, as we will realize later on. And the T cells doesn't like to stick around too much. So what it does is it will escape the bone marrow and it will mature somewhere else and it matures in the thymus, which is a gland right behind your sternum. Uh, now the B cells uh, stick around for a little longer and they mature in the bone marrow. Now this maturation process is extremely important because this is really how uh, the competence happens and how the self-tolerance takes place. The self-tolerance means that the cells you are synthesizing, they are not allowed to attack your own tissue. And that's very important. You're making tons of cells, T cells and B cells, and the last thing you wanna do is to make an army of cells that will attack your own tissue as a target, okay? so. There is a process of maturation. There is a process of self-tolerance that these cells will go through. We're going to start with the B cells. And when we get to the T cells, we're going to repeat the whole thing all over again. But at the P B cells, the cells are made there. And then they stick around. And they start wondering, touching everything surrounding them. If they start to attack the things surrounding them and, say, and they get excited about the things they touch, then they have to be eliminated. Or... There is an alternative. I mean, the bone marrow did a lot of work to make the B cells. So there are two things. If the cells start to get excited about the surrounding, either you kill it or you re-edit it. You change the code. You make it better. And you can, you can do that. And you will see that we have the capacity of changing the code, especially if the cell is never going to be activated. So we're going we're gonna to talk about that and of, of the re-editing of uh, the receptors that are on the B cells. So this is my introduction. Again, we are sticking with the B cells for this part of the lecture. And we'll realize that the B cells, again, they're synthesized in the red bone marrow. They mature in the red bone marrow. After they become mature, then they leave the bone marrow. And some of them are circulating in the blood, but big part of them will be hunkering down in the lymphoid tissues, the secondary lymphoid tissues, as we agreed before. Okay, so once you have mature lymphocytes, whether they're T cells or B cells, they have to be immunocompetent. It means they're able to recognize and bind to a specific antigen. I keep saying antigen, 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 and you're wondering what is an antigen. So we're going to know in the next few slides the definition of an antigen. So that's the first thing. The second is they have to be self-tolerant. It means they should not respond to self-antigens. Imagine you're making army of cells that will attack your own brain or you attack your own spleen. That should not be allowed, okay? So once you do that, 
we are generating hypothetical. If you remember at the lecture, I told you, you are generating hypothetical target. We have receptors that are looking for hypothetical target. Any protein, carbohydrate, or even lipid, sometime is a target, is a game that we're looking for. Does this protein exist? We don't know. Does this polysaccharide pattern even exist? We don't know. But it's good to have an antibody against it anyways, just in case, not an antibody, I'm sorry, a receptor for it anyways, on the T and the B lymphocytes, just in case if we get attacked ever by a protein that looks like this, then we will deal with it. But as long as the T cells and the B cells have never seen that target that they were made to attack, we will call them naive cells. Naive cells are the unexposed cells. Sometimes we call them the virgin B cells and the virgin T cells. Okay? So, they will be exported to the lymph nodes, spleen, lymphoid organs, and hunker down there. So, I keep telling you about the synthesis that we have all these hypothetical things, uh, hypothetical scenarios. We are mix and match between different areas in um, we're mixing and matching some pop-up came to the screen I apologize um, we're mixing and matching between areas in the chromosome number 14 in order for us to make different receptor what does that mean well it means essentially that Imagine if you have a training facility for officers and you are making computer-generated images for hypothetical uh, thieves, hypothetical target, fat, short, you know, tall, muscular, thin, and that's just the physiques. And then, and then you ta you are talking about the height, different height, different hair, the hairstyle, uh, the eyebrows, the everything. You are changing the characters. Uh, the characteristics in the picture based on the computer programming and it's really random and then you have an army of officers that have hypothetical picture in their hand and they're looking for this pretty much the same thing here's what we do without going into extreme details in chromosome 14 we have variable regions some of them are called as the d segments and the other one as the j segments now those are exons and introns and your goal is to mix and match like Lego take a little bit of here a little bit of there and then mix them together and we have different VH region VH1 VH2 VH and and you're mixing and matching taking this plus this plus that and that will be very different than this and this and that and so on so you're having different kind of composition that you can draw and this is a uh, helped by enzymes called RAG1 and RAG2 and then you recombine you re recombine your DNA by a recombinase enzyme and before you recombine as we said in the lecture you have an enzyme called TDT that will spit uh, nucleotides free nucleotides as you are recombining the DNA in again together and that will result in extremely random fashion that you have and therefore you have a wide array of uh, of uh, receptors and that's just one side of the receptor you have to imagine that the receptor is like um, like a plier or like uh, a forceps where it has two sides so you are playing all these match mix and match with one side and then you will play completely different set of mix and match on the other side of that of the pliers the other arm of the plier and then you're maxing, mixing one plus the other one. So you have completely, complete randomness in generating those receptors. But that's great. So we have millions, if not billions, of different alter, alternative uh, combination. And therefore, we have... We are synthesizing essentially receptors and B cells and T cells that have receptors for almost everything out there. Okay? But here's the trick. Some of this is against your own body. And it's your call to eliminate these guys and say, okay, you're going to attack me, right? Then you are eliminated. This is the process of making different 
um, different receptors. Now, the class of the antibody, and we're going to talk about the class of the antibodies later on, you will realize that we have IgM, IgD, IgG, and IgA. Now, your thinking is, or the, is the class having the same antigen response? Yes, because the antigen response is the area is in the active area, in the active region, and we're going to talk about that later on. But here, since we have this picture here, the class of the antigen is really depending on the constant region. And these are the constant region. So you can take one of these and it will make IgG. If you take this one, it will make IgG. If you take this one, it will make IgM because it's the mu. If you take the delta, it will make IgD. If you take the alpha, it will make IgA. Make sense? So, and epsilon, of course, will make IgE. So, this we will talk about later when we talk about the antibody diversity and the diversity of the class of the antibodies. They're very, very important, but without realizing that all of them are coming from the constant region here on the chromosome 14, and you're just choosing one or the other based on the stimulation, based on whether it's acute inflammation or the inflammation didn't happen yet or the response is not there yet or if it's allergy or if you want to secrete it we're going to talk about all that in just a short bit okay so we're going to move along and just show you a picture here of how the b cell receptor looked like these are the receptors that we generated randomly and uh, the same thing with the T cell receptors. You will realize that the B cell receptors have two arms and they are identical, one on this side and one on that side. Those two areas here are identical. It means if I bind substance A here, it will, this part here also will bind substance A, exactly the same substance. But however, this arm is completely different than this arm, but it's really the gap in between that will determine what kind of protein fits there, like a key and a lock, right? So we will talk about that in greater details, but that is the receptor you find on the B cells, or what we call BCR, B cell receptor. Now let's go to the T receptor. It's much shorter, doesn't have that fancy structure, long arm, short arm, it doesn't have that. And it's only one site, and we call that antigen binding site. Now I don't want you to think that a B cell has only one receptor on the surface. No, it has thousands of receptors on the surface, but they are all identical. And the same thing, a T cell will have thousands of receptors on the surface, but they're all identical, right? So that's an important note to make. So just don't think there is a poor little cell wandering around with only one receptor on the surface. No, it has thousands of receptors, but they're all the same kind and they will target the same antigen anyways, okay? So here's another picture for the B cell receptor, and here is the T cell receptor, and it's very important that we will realize in the next lecture how the activation of the T lymphocytes occur and the role of the T cell receptor as it will become apparent to us later on, okay? So we we'll move on. I keep telling you that oh, the T cell receptor will recognize an antigen, the B cell recognize an antigen. So what's an antigen? What does it mean? An antigen is a substance that can mobilize the adaptive defenses and provoke an immune response. That's the definition of an antigen. If it's recognized and then you have an immune response, good. If it's recognized and no immune response happening, then nothing will happen at all. We call that energy. It will just fade away and those cells will be useless because they will never be activated. So it has to be recognized and you have to elicit an immune response. Some of the antigens are big on the bacteria, proteins, carbs, polysaccharides, and some of them are really small, like pieces of peptides. It can be, or a very short um, toxin, and these can be tiny, tiny ones. Okay, so that's the complete antigen. Important function for uh, the important, important characteristic of the complete antigen is that it's immunogenic and it's reactive. 
it will elicit an immune it will elicit immune response what's the immune response it's the proliferation of specific lymphocytes and the generation of antibodies that's the that's the immune response we're looking for and it has to react with product with the products of the activated lymphocytes. What are the products of the activated lymphocytes? Well, the cytotoxic T, that's a product, and which is the activated cytotoxic T, and the antibodies that are released as well. That's what it means, okay? So, example, like foreign proteins, polysaccharides, lipids, nucleic acid, all of these will be antigens. Now, there is another word called heptans. And these are incomplete antigens, like what? Like penicillin, okay? like cosmetics. These are too small, like poison ivy. These are too small to make an antigenic response, an immune response on their own. But they become uh, immune, they, they initiate immune response. It means they will become immunogenic only when they attach themselves to proteins. That's a very important thing. That's why penicillin or latex, uh, the latex gloves, they're not antigens themselves. They are too small to become antigen. But once they adhere to a surface protein, then they become antigens. So it's like heptins are like the half antigens. They're not complete antigens, but once they attach themselves into a protein, then we call them antigens, okay, at that point, okay. So there are certain things on the surface of uh, the antigen that will determine the reactivity. Remember that it's like um, lobster claws that we saw with, uh, with the receptors and also the antibodies have the same kind of lobster claws. And, but it has to fit this gap between the claws. It has to fit a specific antigen, nothing else. That's the only thing that can fit there. If it fit there, it will turn the key on and the cell is excited or the antibody will start binding to it. If it doesn't fit there, then it's not recognizable. So, but what is the area that binds? We agreed that the protein is so huge, you can't imagine that the entire protein will fit in this tiny little claw, right? So part of the protein will fit in there. That's what the antigen determination would mean. It's the area on the antigen, the part of the entire antigen that's actually immunogenic, okay? And sometimes we take a tiny little piece of a protein, a small peptide sequence, and we know this is the one that will initiate immune response. Okay, and that's what we use, for example, to generate monoclonal antibodies. We don't use the entire protein, but we use a tiny little part that will elicit an immunogenic response or, or an immune response. Sorry. Okay, so with this, we need to understand that we have our own antigens. What does that mean? Well, an antigen is the one that elicits an immune response, has to be reactive. So if there is a protein in you that will elicit some kind of a response, some kind of a response, not necessarily activate the cells or anything, we will call that self-antigens. And my self-antigens are different than your self-antigens. You inherit three from your father and three from your mother, and it's the combination between the, these three and those three it will make the, the, the different types of uh, or the different uh, flavor of the MHC. In general, however, we have two classes of MHC. Sometimes, by the way, it's referred to as HLA, especially if you have worked in a transplant lab, you will listen, you will hear a lot about HLA. They don't, they don't use M MHC there. MHC means major histocompatibility complex, okay? Major histocompatibility complex. That's what MHC stands for. And this is, here's the unique thing about the MHC. MHC is that little protein that's sitting on the cell membrane, okay? And it really has enormous function. Number one, it acts as an identifier for you. So that's why my tissues cannot be donated just easily to someone else, right? We have to give drugs, we have to give this, or he's my twin or she's Okay, so identical twin or a family member, unless we put heavy drugs that will regulate the immune response. Okay, so that's all based on the MHC. My MHC signature is different than your MHC signature. Okay, 
In addition to this, okay, in addition to the fact that it will give you the identity of your own tissue, okay, MHC will carry on their back fragments of proteins. That's a very, 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 very important thing, okay? Where did this fra these fragments come from? It depends. We have two classes of MHC. One is called MHC1, and the other one is called MHC2. MHC1 will carry proteins on it that you made inside the cells, whatever those proteins are. Anything you make inside the cells, it will take pieces, it will take samples of it and present those samples outside. Say, hey, see, this is what we made inside the cells. But that's for MHC1. But guess what else is made inside the MH, inside the cells? Can you think for a second? What kind of proteins other than the cell's own proteins are made inside the Golgi apparatus of a cell? The viral proteins. If the cell is infected with a virus, it will use the same machinery. It will use the same endoplasmic reticulum, use the same Golgi to make proteins, but these proteins belong to the virus. But still, the MHC1 will sample these proteins the same way it sampled your endogenous proteins. So it will also represent a sample of the proteins. Well, here is our production, but this time it's a virus. And this is very critical because otherwise the virus will never be detected because viruses are inside the cells. How would I tell the rest of the world as a cell that's being infected with a virus that I'm being infected with a virus and I need to be destroyed? How would I tell everyone except in the process of making the viral proteins, some of these viral proteins will also, small peptides, will get into the MHC and get presented at the surface to tell everyone, and we will know in a in, in very short bit who is everyone, that we have a virus inside. See? That's MHC1. Okay? So, where is MHC1? MHC1 is present in every nucleated cell. It has to have a nucleus. What does that mean? It means red blood cells don't have MHC1. Period. Okay? Because red blood cells don't have nuclei. Right? So, MHC1 will be on all nucleated cells, right? That's why we can easily transplant nucleated, uh, non-nucleated cells like red blood cells from one person to another in blood transfusion without any problem. Some of you will ask about the white blood cells. They're so little, it doesn't really matter if we put just a little bit of white blood cells, but it's mainly the red blood cells we're transfusing, okay? so. Class 1 MHC, they're found on all body cells, the nucleated ones, okay? What do they present? They present any protein, any protein that's made, this is important, made inside the cells, right? So even if it's a viral protein, but it's made inside the cells, part of it, part of these proteins will find themselves mysteriously and we will see how the process is on the surface of the cell. So the cell will tell the rest of the world that now we are being infected with a virus, okay? Now, class two MHC are different. Class two MHC, they're found only on the antigen presenting cells. Like who? Like the macrophages and the dendritic cells and the B lymphocytes. You will find MHC too. And they will only present what the cell has eaten, okay? Polymorphs, the neutrophils, don't have that. The neutrophils don't have MHC2. So don't, class 2 MHC is not there. But the macrophages, dendritic cells, and B cells will have that. And its function, okay, other than the self-identification we discussed together, but its function also is the proteins that you ate, you ate something, you chew it, you cut it down, you break it, and tiny little pieces of what you ate, not what you made, what you ate, will find itself on the surface of class 2 MHC. Make sense? So, moving along, 
The cells we have, so now we know the MHC, the antigens. We understand what is an antigen, what are the self-antigens. We understand the class 1 MHC, and we understand what's class 2 MHC. Then we move on now into the cells. We have the B cells and the T cells. The T cells, later on, you will realize that it's much more than just T cells. We have many subclasses of T cells. We also have what we call antigen-presenting cells, and these are part of the innate system. Innate. They don't have a specific target. They look for something to eat. B cells, although the B cells themselves can make antibodies, and the antibody they make is part of the adaptive response, their phagocytic action, their phagocytic action is part of the innate system because they can just eat about anything. It's not specific. So they eat non-specifically, but when they make an antibody, they make the antibody specifically. So they have two functions. One is an innate function, and the other one is an adaptive function. Okay? Macrophages and dendritic cells, they would also eat something, chew it up, present it on the surface. All of these guys are what we call antigen-presenting cells. And as I explained to you in the lecture, these are like, you know, the, the medieval war hero that would go into a war and then would, you know, carry trophies of the dead bodies he killed or she killed, you know, nose, ear, piece of bone, a teeth or something to let everyone know this is what we killed. Well, the antigen-presenting cells do the same thing. Not for proud, not for pride. They don't do that just for a show-off. They do it to tell us all that there has been a struggle and to elicit the adaptive immune response. And we will see how the antigen-presenting cells are extremely critical when it comes to eliciting the adaptive response. Okay? So... <clears throat> Antigen-presenting cells, they would engulf the antigen. They will take the antigen, break it up. And like what? Uh, what do we have? We have dendritic cells, macrophages, B cells. All of these are antigen-presenting cells. And they will present their pieces on the surface for the T cells. In particular, they will present that for uh, not the cytotoxic T cells, but for the, the T helper cells, okay? That's very important. That's very, 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 very important process how the T helpers become activated. We will realize later on that the T helper cells have a receptor called CD4, and the cytotoxic T cells, they have receptors called CD8. So CD4 will bind to class 2 MHC, CD8 will bind to class 1 MHC. We're going to get back to this, but I just want you to appreciate what antigen-presenting cells are capable of. Okay? So, moving along, this is a picture here of dendritic cells. Interestingly enough, when it gets activated, when it engulfs something, it will change shape. And it gets activated, it secretes cytokines, secretes TNF, secretes IL-1, secretes IL-6, secretes a lot of stuff. And at the same time, it will also secrete something called B7. It's a B7 protein, and the B7 protein is extremely critical, as we will learn later on. Because without the B7, um, the, the T cells, the, 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 uh, the, the, the T helper cells will never be activated you have to have the B7 protein on it. Anyways, once it, it's activated, this guy will, act, will get activated by something they ate or they struggled with, then it will leave the tissue and it will end up in the lymphatic circulation. And that's a very important thing to bring those antigens on the surface close to the lymphocytes which are sitting in the lymphatic system. This is just an example here how an antigen presenting cells has MHC2 on the surface and MHC2 will have an antigen sitting on. This will attach to this one with uh, what we call CD4 and that's a receptor that will attach to MHC2. At the same time, CD28 needs to bind to what we call CD80. Another name for CD80 is B7, and when they bind together, that's the only way we activate the T-helper lymphocyte. Okay? 
we're gonna get back to this so you don't have to worry and when, what happens when the T helper uh, the the the, lim uh, the T helper cells are activated what happens then is a whole different story okay so you just need to understand now the importance of the antigen presenting cells you need to know what are they the macrophages the dendritic and the B cells why are they important because they would take something chew it to pieces and put it in uh, secretory vesicles and those secretory vesicles part of these proteins will channel back and find itself on the surface of these cells as a trophy to let everyone know what they chewed and therefore they are capable of activating the T lymphocytes as we will study later on okay all right moving along and so we have the macrophages once once again we have the macrophages we have the dendritic cells the dendritic cells they will internalize the pathogens the macrophages also will internalize the pathogens they chew things up and they will interact with the T cells in order for you to activate it so the macrophages and the dendritic cells, what they're also capable of doing, they will poke the macrophages and they will make the macrophages, one, I'm sorry, the activated T cells, once it's activated, it will activate back the macrophages. This is a very interesting relationship because it was the macrophages that stimulated the T cells. But then later on, the T cells are also capable of stimulating the macrophages and making the macrophages much more aggressive. It's almost like a positive feedback. That's a very, very important strategy. Okay. So these tiny little fragments that got on class 2 MHC, these fragments, how did they come there? What are the proteins that are on MHC? Don't say that these are the proteins that are synthesized in the cell. These are the proteins that were chewed by the cell. This is the leftover of the struggle that got chewed off by the cells and then part of them will, be, will find itself on class 2 MHC. And it's recognized by the T helper cells or what we call CD4 cells. T helper or sometimes it's referred to as T and lower, uh, lowercase h cells. So the T helper cells are the ones that will bind to class 2 MHC. Here's what happens. So you are engulfing something, okay? You will chew it. Some of these proteins will find their way. As you see, you're breaking it into tiny pieces. Some of these proteins will find their way onto the surface, into a little crypt here on the surface on class 2 MHC. And when class 2 MHC finds its way on the cell membrane, now you have class 2 MHC along with an antigenic peptide that came originally from the thing you chewed. See how it is? Okay, that's MHC, that's class 2 MHC. Please don't confuse it with class 1 MHC. Class 1 MHC is not gonna carry proteins that you ate, it's gonna carry proteins that you synthesized. See the difference? Okay. So, now let's go talk about the B lymphocytes. Okay. So, now we understand what is, what is antigen. We understand now what's MHC. What are B lymphocytes? Well, we agreed together that it is made in the red bone marrow and it matures there. It sits around till it matures. What does it mean maturation? It means, well, it has to be competent. It has to be able to bind an antigen. They also have to be self-tolerant. It means you are not gonna bind your own thing, okay? And once it's activated, it will leave. There is a process of receptor editing, but we don't have to know about this. Let's just assume whatever you make is the end of it, okay? So, antigens can stimulate the, the B cells directly, but that's not a very good response. Generally, in order for you to stimulate the B cells really heavily, you need to activate it with the T helper cells. T helper cells are the ones that really make the B lymphocytes crazy, okay? Doesn't mean that the B lymphocytes are not able to be activated on their own just by binding the active and find, uh, the, the antigen, finding it, chewing it, and getting activated, you know, self-activated, but it's really the T helper cells, the T helper cells are the ones that really do the trick. And the funny thing is this, the T helpers will, will fire up the B lymphocytes and the B lymphocytes, when they are fired, 
they will activate the T helper as well. And then the T helper does other things. So there is a very nice relationship between the two. But before they get stimulated, again, they are virgin cells and they will sit dormant, right? Don't do anything. They're just sitting around because they don't know if that antigen particularly exists or they were made in vain. We don't know yet. We were just synthesized randomly. The good thing is that we, the B cells, are not attacking our own tissues. And so we can just sit around here and find out if there is a protein that comes by that we have a match for. This is how immune response will work. So the B cells will be converted into plasma cells. And it's the plasma cells, if the B cells get activated, are the ones that would produce the antibodies. It's not just a simple process like that. We're going to talk how it happens. But this is the function of the B cells eventually. It also shares in the activation of the T lymphocytes, as we will see later on. Okay? So, as I said earlier, the B cells can get activated directly by an antigen, as you can see here, right? But that's rare. We call that T helper independent activation of B cells. It means the B cells did not need the T helper. In most cases, and you get really good response if the antigen is chewed up by the B cells. Remember, the B cells are phagocytic cells that they also have MHC class 2, right? They're antigen presenting cells. Remember, APC cells? So it will have this guy here, which chew the chew product of this one, it will have it on the surface, okay? Now, this will bind to a receptor called T cell receptor, and how do they bind together is the fact that we have CD4, which is the receptor of the T helper cell, will bind to MHC2. So now we have this guy poking around and finding the MHC, and this guy here is looking inside the hole and seeing if it's something interesting to eat. And if it's not interesting, it will go away. If it's interesting, it's going to stick around. Okay. Another signal we need here is the CD40 also to be, CD40 will be on the B cell to activate what we call CD40 ligand, okay? That is on the T helper cell, okay? So we'll have this activation figured out when we get to the T cells, but I just want you to realize now the activation of the B cells can happen this way, or it can happen by IL-2, 4, or 5 that are secreted by the T helper cells in response to the T helper cells being activated by an antigen that is presented on the MHC, on class 2 MHC. Complicated. Let me say that again. Antigen gets chewed up by the B cells. Now, tiny little pieces here. These pieces will find their way on MHC class 2. This will be detected by TCR, which is T cell receptor. Eventually, because of the events that happen here and the events that will take care take place here, the T helper cells will become activated. When they are activated, they will start secreting IL-2, interleukin-2, 4, and 5. Those will bind to interleukin receptor on the B cells, and therefore the B cells will become activated. See how it is? So, again, two processes for activating the B cells. Direct way, antigen binding to the cells, activating the cells. But that's very rare the, and not very strong either. The other one that's much stronger is if the antigen gets chewed up, gets presented on MHC class 2, gets um, uh, figured out by T cell receptor, and then the T helper cells are activated and when the T helper cells are activated, then you are secreting IL-2, 4, and 5, and that will fire IL receptor, and therefore you are stimulating the B cell. Okay? All right. So we have the antigen challenge. We bound now to an antigen, and now we get the B cells are activated. Okay? So if the lymphocyte is the B cells, the antigen, or the cell next door, which is the T helper cell, will provoke a response, and therefore the T lymphocytes now are activated and the antibodies are produced. But first, before we produce an antibody, we will have to make plasma cells. Not all the cells. Here is the trick now. Imagine the situation. Okay? 
you made random clones, random cells. Each of them have a unique picture because it was randomly generated, okay? Of course, you can make it over and over again because it's random and the random process can happen again and again and again. That's fine. And you're wandering around carrying this ID and not knowing that this target ever exists. But then you find the target. Do you think it's wise to send this very unique cell that you spent maybe a year to figure it out and to make it and you send it just to fight and die? No. What you do is you multiply it first and then you keep like few of them to yourself. You don't send them to fight but they have the same ID picture because you multiplied it. You made clones. This is an important word. Clones. You cloned that cell just like the dolly. You cloned it. And these were very critical so you cloned them and then some send some to fight and keep the rest. See? And we'll see how this process is made in the next few slides. So T cells can be activated with an antigen bind to the surface receptor. And the receptor will mediate endocytosis. The stimulated B cells will grow to form a clone. The T cells, as we said in the picture, are usually required to help the B cells achieve full activation. Fine. Let's say that we activated the B cells. Now what? Activated the B cells, we have to multiply the B cells. We make thousands of that unique guy that was able to detect polio, you know, polio protein. We didn't even know that it exists as a cell. But now that we encountered it, we make thousands of the cells, millions of the cells that can now fight and detect the polio, okay? multiply it, clone it, and then send some to be differentiated into plasma cells. Only some will become plasma cells and the rest go fight. First, before, the, before they become plasma cells, I'm sorry, you multiply them, keep some, and the rest can be plasma cells. The plasma cells will make antibodies for you. This is the process. Each plasma cell will make 2000 molecules of antibodies per second. But because they're making so much, they will forget about their own life and they will eventually die. Four to five days, the plasma cells will die. But in the meanwhile, you have the good old cells that you kept for safekeeping. That's a very important thing. We call that the memory cells. Okay? Okay. So, I uh, had a little interruption making this video. Uh, anyhow, so where do the clones uh, go? I mean, we, we agreed now that uh, the B lymphocytes are, are going to be activated. And there are two ways of activation. Either they are activated by the T helper cells or T helper independent activation, which is not very good as we agree. Okay. so. If they become activated, we agreed that some of them, that it will multiply and some of them will become plasma cells and the rest we will keep as memory cells, as we will see later on. Those plasma cells will start making antibodies, about 2000 molecules per second or so, and they will survive for about four or five days before they undergo apoptosis. Okay. The antibodies that they will make uh, will circulate in the blood or in the lymph and they will bind to free antigens. Now remember, um, this is one of the reasons we open up the capillaries to allow proteins from the blood to go into the tissues, hoping that the blood will be carrying antigens, but they will only uh, carry antigen if you were already exposed to the disease or the disease has been lingering for a while. And that's when the antigens, of course, will come to the tissue and uh, eradicate the problem for you. And we will see how anti how antibodies uh, do that. So um, one of the really good th things about the antibodies, if you remember the process of opsonization, which we uh, talked about earlier, and we discussed how the complement proteins are capable of making opsonization. Uh, the main opsonizing agent in your blood, in your system, is immunoglobulin G. That is the main... Uh, uh, opsonizing uh, agent that will mark antigens, bacteria, cells, whatever, 
for destruction later on. And that destruction can actually invite your innate system. Remember, the opsonization uh, likes to have something that uh, the, the, the the phagocytes, I'm sorry, likes to have something that makes it more appealing for them to digest. So the neutrophils will enjoy the fact that your target now is opsonized, and the same thing with the macrophages, they will like that. Okay, so. The clone cells that do not become plasma cells, they become memory cells. They will hold on the information in case a year later, a few months later, a couple of years later or so, uh, you get exposure to um, that particular antigen again. The exposure doesn't have to be uh, a sickness. Even a tiny little exposure will remind your system that, hey, you remember this guy, remember this guy, remember this guy. So your memory will be always up to date, like uh, remembering how the polio virus is. So we uh, have been vaccinated when we were little against, uh, you know, smallpox and against uh, maybe um, rubella, pertussis, mumps and, uh, and measles, all, all these things uh, we were vaccinated against. And we don't have to get vaccination again because we already have the memory cells in our system that are there and they we already know now how the virus looks like and our memory cells are ready to act if the B cells, if they see this antigen one more time, uh, the memory cells will produce to you this time tons of antibodies and besides they don't have to mature they already are mature they are already uh, differentiated they are already selected and there is already tons of them so if you get a second exposure the response is much stronger and much faster as well we call that the secondary immune response okay so here what happens, um, here are the naive cells or the virgin cells and when they get exposed to the antigen for the first time, whether the exposure is through the B cells or without the B cells, and these are the receptors, these are not the antibodies here, these are the receptors and we call them B cell receptors, and they will proliferate, make clones, and some of the clones will um, end up differentiating into plasma cells, those are making the antibodies and the others a small portion will be kept as memory cells for the future. Now, that is called the primary immune response. That is occurred in response to the first exposure to a specific antigen. So for example, the first time you get vaccinated against a certain thing, okay? We have memory cells, right? So, but because it takes a long time for the plasma cells and the, to happen and the for the for the b cells to actually give you the response you want and mature to plasma cells it takes there is something called lag period from the time you are exposed to the disease to the time you start to see the antibodies in your system it takes about three to six days depending on the antigen now it's very different than the secondary immune response when you have been already exposed exposed to an antigen, you will see how fast we get the antibodies, much, much faster than this, okay? And the peak of the plasma antibodies can be reached in about 10 days now, and then it will decline. Now, if you look at the secondary immune response, it is from its name, it's secondary, so it's the second time you are exposed to it. The memory cells now, not the virgin cells, not the not the the, the 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 naive B cells, but the memory cells are the one that are gonna take care of this. And because it's the memory cells, the antibodies will peak in two days, just two to three days, not ten days. Two to three days, antibody level is much higher, and they will stay high for weeks or even months. And that's very good. That's what we call the booster vaccination. If you have, if you ever listen to that booster dose of certain vaccine and when you remind your system of the same vaccine that you had before then the response is much bigger think of it as like a gang which made a really big hit and uh, some of them were arrested if the same gang come again you're ready for them and they're gonna get it this time because you remember how they look you don't have to figure it out again and the same thing here we have with the immunological 
memory, okay? So this was the primary response here. These are the naive cells. They get activated once again, either through the T helper cells or by themselves, which is not very efficient as we agreed. They will multiply some of, and what we call cloning. And when they, when they are cloned, some of the clones will be kept as memory cells and the others will differentiate. These cells will die in five days or so because they're producing tons of antibodies. In the meanwhile, this one, this one you keep it for even years, uh, usually a couple of years. And then every now and then when you are reminded of the antigen, you are producing more and more and more. Uh, but some, we think it lasts many, many, many years. Um, so when, when they encounter a second hit, then the response, as you can see, is much more, uh, A, it's rapid, B, it's much uh, stronger. See how many plasma cells. This is just an illustration here. But that doesn't mean that we're getting rid of the memory cells. We are still keeping the memory cells for the future. So every time we get a hit, some will become plasma cells and the others will be kept as memory cells, okay? So uh, here is a graph just to illustrate to us the, the response to an antigen. When you are uh, facing an antigen, the first response you will get, it will be about seven to eight days and then it will fade away in like three weeks or so. If you start getting a second uh, stimulus here, the, uh, the second res response is immediate and you have much, much higher, um, these are, this is a logarithmic, uh, so you have a thousand fold higher um, levels of antibodies as compared to the levels you got from the very first exposure, okay? So, um, when the B cells are, when the B cells encounter an antigen, they produce specific antibodies, we already agreed about that, and that we call vaccination, right? So you can vaccinate the person um, actively either by getting sick. Um, if you get sick once to a disease, you're not going to get sick again with that disease. Or we can take a virus or a bacteria, crush them, beat them up, make some mutation in them so they don't really multiply. And we use that to um, sensitize, sensitize your B cells um, as the first and second hit, and that's what we call vaccination. So this is the process of what we call active um, immune, uh, active humoral immunity that we are providing it. Either you get that through infection or through vaccination. But if you don't have time, let's say you got bit by a snake or uh, you have rabies, um, you don't have time to wait for the antibodies to start developing. That will be, you know, a few weeks. Or if you are, um, if you ate some really bad meat and you have now uh, botulism, uh, which is the botul botulinum, uh, botulinum uh, toxin, uh, you would like to give immediately the antidote. You're not going to wait. Um, you, so what you do, what is the antidote? They're really the antibodies. Uh, already made for you. But because the antibodies are already made for you, uh, once the antibodies are done, are gone, you don't have memory for it. So the memory is only if you are experiencing antigen and the antigen is stimulating the B cells and the B cells, some of them will mature and the other and will become uh, plasma cells and the other will have memory that you will have memory for. But if you're already making a shortcut because you're in a hurry and you're giving those antibodies, uh, then you're not having uh, a memory for that. So um, that we can do in extreme conditions like this, but it also happens naturally. We have, for example, IgA that can be secreted in the milk and therefore the baby can have uh, a use of that especially if his uh, if the mother is nursing igg can cross the placental barrier and that provides also some immunity as well at least in the first uh, few months of life uh, but again a few days of life for the igg and the iga in the milk at least for the first year if the baby is nursing for a year. So, uh, but from that, you also realize that Ig uh, giving the baby IgA or IgG is not going to produce memory immunity, but it's going to produce transient immunity 
but this is enough and then hopefully the vaccination and the subclinical exposure to uh, the environment will start building up some more um, immunity for the child okay so the passive humoral immunity we can give that either naturally acquired either by through the placenta or the milk or artificially acquired that's when you are sick and you really need the antibodies immediately uh, you get bit by a snake or a rabies or uh, uh, or you are suffering from uh, botulism or whatever the condition is that requires immediate intervention and you give immediately the antibodies okay so what do the antibodies look like well they look like a y molecule and they have four chains what two what we call two long chains and two short chains we're gonna let's have a look at the structure here so this is a long chain and all of this is the long chain and this is a short chain and they are linked here by disulfide bonds and the long chain has the variable region and the constant region the short chain or the light chain has also the variable region and a constant region and but the variable region we agreed before that the variable region is different from uh, the long chain to the other one and that will create sort of um, a docking station that is unique to that particular antigen because you are mix and match you are mixing and matching long chains with short chains and that that will create lots of diversity so this is pretty much the structure more or less of the antibodies and then the constant region which is referred to here as uh, with a c letter the constant region uh, varies uh, also which will provide to you the classes but not not billion time variation or more as you see here with the variable region here we have only four or five different variables um, like the mu will give you igm alpha will give you iga uh, and then gamma will give you IgG, delta will give you IgD, and epsilon will give you IgE. So that changes a little, but that will determine, this is an important word to remember, this part here will determine the antibody class, and this part here will determine the antibody reactivity. That's important this part will determine the reactivity of the antibody this part here will determine the class of the antibody okay all right so again they either look like a t or a y and they can make shapes they can be monomer just by themselves or they can uh, make polymers or pentamers like IgM. IgM binds to each other. It can can have five different antibodies binding to each other. Then it's capable of binding ten antigens, and that's a very important uh, thing indeed. Again, the constant region uh, will determine the class, whether it's IgM, IgA, IgD, IgG, or IgE, as I told you earlier. And we will see now how the antibodies, once again, here's, here are how the antibodies look like. And let's talk about the classes of the IgM. So we have IgM that can form a pentamer, which means five different antibodies are linked together. And that would produce to you 10 different spots to bind things remember every antibody has two different spots so you have five multiplied by two so you have ten different uh, spots and that's why it's very capable of precipitating things and agglutinating and we'll see what agglutination means which is another word for precipitation but it happens for cells you bind cells together you tie them together sort of like you know you're catching uh, lots of animals together with the same net and now they're immobilized they can't go anywhere and that's what you know precipitation and agglutination would mean why is IgM more capable than the others because IgM can form pentamers which means it has five of the same binding together and that will mean this pentamer will be capable of binding and I'll have a picture later on to demonstrate that for you um, that pentamer IgM will have the ability to bind 
10 different targets at the same time. So if you want to remember IgM, if you count one, two, three, four, five, so IgM is the only one that is capable of forming pentamers. Okay, that's how you remember it. Okay, IgA, that's the secretory one. That That's the one you have in the sweat. You have the one you have in the... Um, in the in the breast milk and it's capable it, it's also in the mucus and it is um, capable of making a dimer meaning the IgA and another IgA can bind together and that is the secretory kind so here is the IgM see here's one two three four five and they're capable of linking each other to, linking to each other and therefore we have let's count together one two three four five six seven eight nine ten ten different sites that and you can see easily that when you have a bacteria here and a bacteria here a bacteria here easily this structure is capable of precipitating them all together and then of course you have if this is binding to a bacteria here but the bacteria can also attract other 10 so you have 10 here that bind to this one and 10 that bind to this one so you all of a sudden you have a very large mass that will immobilize your bacteria and you will see how what that means when we get to the function of the antibodies in a short bit okay IgA on the other hand is the secretory type so this one is the one that makes pentamers. By the way, IgM is the first responder, is the very first responder. It happens immediately when you are exposed to the antigen. And that is a very good indication for, you know, how acute was the infection. IgM is your first class. And then you have what we call class switch. Then you go from IgM into making IgG, okay? IgG happens later. IgM is the very acute one. IgA will happen later than that. Okay, so IgD, we don't really know the function for the IgD, but, uh, but it might function as a B cell receptor. That's what we think. IgG is a monomer. It doesn't make any dimer or pentamers or anything. It's the most important one and it crosses the placental barrier and add another point here which is a very important point IgG is the only one capable of opsonization IgG is the only one capable of opsonization okay remember this for a fact okay the very last type is a really nasty one IgE and that's because the epsilon region in the constant region it binds to the basophils and when it binds to the basophils, it will release histamine for it, from it. And therefore, the release of IgE can result in allergic reaction or hypersensitivity reaction because IgE is capable of stimulating the basophils and the basophils, as a result, will cause the release of histamine. Okay? All right. So here, uh, here is the IgD, and you can see this area here is really, really short too in the IgD, and it's just a receptor. It doesn't go anywhere. IgG is the most important kind of all, and um, and it's the acute. It's uh, and it will happen in both the primary and the secondary response. It crosses the placental barrier. This is a very important characteristic about the IgG that it crosses the placental barrier. But what we also need to know is that IgG is the only antibody that is capable of uh, opsonization. Now IgE, we agreed that E is associated with allergy. And uh, the, the, uh, why is that? Because the epsilon region uh, will stimulate indeed your basophils and therefore will release histamine if that happens systematically. Can you imagine histamine everywhere in your system, even in your lungs, causing vasodilation everywhere? And now your lungs have edema, you're not able to breathe, uh, your bronchioles have edema and it's tight. Um, that's what happens when someone has an anaphylactic shock. Okay? All right. Add to the fact that it will cause vasodilation in your blood vessels, and so your blood pressure, of course, will drop uh, like a stone. So that's the problem. We will talk about that when we get to the abnormal 
immune response and the unusual immune response, as you will see later on. Okay? We did talk about the diversity and I told you about the class switch. I want you to remember this that the first responder you have is the IgM, then the IgG happens. This is something we call class switch. Class switch. When you switch the DNA, the, 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 uh, the immunoglobulin composition from IgM into the other types. Now we all agreed that the epsilon region is sort of the worst of all of them because it will result in uh, uh, a very uh, unfavorable immune reaction. Okay, so what do the antibodies do? Let's, let's have a look at the picture. I mean, we keep saying antibodies will do this, antibodies will do that. So let's see here the pictures. Um, let's say we have a toxin like uh, cholera toxin, pertussis toxin, uh, um, uh, any, any kind of toxin like uh, Botox even. Uh, we talked about if someone has uh, botulism or tetanus toxin. So if you have a toxin and that toxin, if it finds its target, it's going to cause problem. If the antibodies find it first, they will neutralize the active areas and therefore that toxin now is worthless. It, can, it can't even cross any barrier once you neutralize it with the antibodies. So this is one way how antibodies are capable of functioning. The other thing is we is called, let's start with the precipitation. If we have something here and the best one that makes this is your IgM. So we have one antigen that can be bound by three different, uh, like bacteria. Let's say that this is a bacteria. This is an antigen, this is an antigen, this is an antigen. Each of them will bind a specific epitope here. And now you have three binding to this one. At the same time, you have other three binding to this, another three binding to this. So you end up precipitating that antigen. Think of this antigen as a virus. If the virus, which moves very quickly, all of a sudden now, you immobilized it by precipitating it around. Then you uh, made sure that the threat is not there anymore. And once it's precipitated like that, it's going to invoke another response, like macrophages will say, hey, what is this precipitation doing here? I'm going to destroy that. I'm going to chew that. And the same thing with the neutrophils are going to destroy this because this kind of um, precipitation shouldn't be there to begin with. Okay? So... At the same time, uh, if it's not just bacteria or tiny things, but if it's cells, like someone got a mis mismatched blood transfusion, then it will be precipitation, but this time because it's cells, uh, we will not call it precipitation, we will call it agglutination. You're bringing, binding the red blood cells together, squeezing them against each other, and essentially they will start slicing and rupturing, okay? If you remember, the antibodies are capable of stimulating the complement system. That is the shortest cut to activate the complement proteins. So that's another um, thing the antibodies are capable of. All of that, it will enhance either the cell lysis by the complement system, phagocytosis by agglutination or precipitation, or inflammatory process. It will also stimulate uh, the antibodies once they bind to, um, um, like here we have IgE binding to basophils, and that will release some um, uh, 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 that will release histamine, but also it's capable of uh, releasing, once the antibody is recognized by neutrophils, for example, they're capable of secreting chemotaxis, and that will increase the, the inflammation even further. So these are different responses to the antibodies, and as you can see, antibodies are very, very critical uh, in activating all these processes, and uh, it's no wonder that we rely on antibodies to defend us uh, very efficiently. That's not the only thing that defends us, because we will learn later on about the T cells, the T lymphocytes, and how the T lymphocytes have what we call cell-mediated immune response, and we're going to talk about that in the next and the final um, uh, part of this uh, presentation. 
So every now and then things go wrong. We don't have to remember um, uh, this much. Uh, we're going to discuss it in the classroom together. Uh, but immune complex diseases happen either because your body start to recognize your own proteins as antigen or you precipitated some antigens that are circulating in the blood and that antigen now precipitated on certain area like in your kidneys for example and now your body doesn't like that so it's going to start immune response against not your body first but against that precipitated material and when you start bringing in antibodies uh, you know in the war there is always casualties and things will start to be vague and uh, there will be um, what you call that um, uh, friendly fires and you start in the middle of the war you start destroying other tissues because you're bringing in you know inflammatory response and you're going to start destroying your own tissue as a response so without going into extreme details about the immune complex disease it's when your body misunderstands the situation either primarily uh, as a primary response or as a secondary response to something else like precipitation of uh, of uh, antigen antibody complexes in your kidneys for example and that can lead to 